Good morning, everybody. Good morning one more time. It is great to see you this morning as we um, continue our Bible study series on the seven churches of Revelation, the state of the church, Christ's very own words to the seven congregations in Asia Minor, oh gosh, uh, over 1900 years ago. Uh, if you're joining us for the live stream, if we're running a tad behind today, a little some technical glitches. I am Pastor Rob Harbin, uh, one of the pastors that serve God's people, and Pastor Clayton Sellers is... He, he had to uh, set up the camera and get everything uh, started up there for the live stream. So, Pastor Clayton, we're glad that you are able to, to be here today. Welcome back from Texas. How, how was uh, Jake's uh, high school graduation? Okay, I got. It. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's not dressed. No, he, he's not wired for sound, is what he. What is not? But he'll get wired for sound here in two seconds. There we go. I should be good now. All right. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. If you're at home right now and uh, me you're following the live stream and you you can't hear any audio, you got to let us know what's going on because we're a little um, uh, short-handed. short-handed. It's vacation season, so I was asking Pastor Clayton, yep. how was your brother's high school graduation? It was good. He uh, he was the salutatorian, so he gave oh. <laughs> 18 kids in his class. Couldn't couldn't make valedictorian. <laughs> couldn't make valedictorian. 18 kids in his class at Concordia Lutheran High School. He gave the salutatorian address. Did a very good job. Um, and so here we are. And you're back. Well, and we're I'm glad, back. glad you made it back. Uh, you were in our prayers. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, so that we can make the most of the time that we have, I want to uh, offer you a few reminders. We're almost finished with this Bible study series. We do have one more church uh, to go, which, of course, is going to be the church in Laodicea. Uh, But we will uh, not have Bible class next week. Instead, there's going to be a voters meeting in the sanctuary beginning at 940. Uh, We are asking folks to uh, fully participate and attend the voters meeting. Uh, We are voting on the budget for the next fiscal year. Remember that our uh, fiscal year begins in July, uh, July 1, uh, not January like, you know, some places. Um, so we're also going to be voting on several officers, uh, in, in, including a changeover of the, um, uh, including a changeover of the president of the con- chairman of the congregation. So uh, we might as well say thank you, Ed, right now for for, <laughs> for serving over this last term. But uh, he will be stepping away, and y- you'll be voting on on new off- some new officers. So. Uh, please attend. Be informed of what's going on in the life of the congregation. Um, both pastors will be there. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, all the more reason to come and just join <laughs> us. Uh, at any rate, uh, with the uh, live stream class, um, if you have any comments or questions, let us know. The pastors have our phones. And a uh, quick reminder, keep your comments here in the room concise or your questions concise so Pastor Clayton can repeat them. All right. So if you'd bow your heads and your hearts with me, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. O Holy Spirit, on this Pentecost Sunday, we are mindful of your presence among us as you promised to be through the word and the sacraments. Uh, We thank you that you first um, came down upon the the New Testament church and these visible, audible um, signs and wonders. Uh, And you come among us. uh, it, in, in, in great miracles by giving us the gift of faith, which a mir- is a miracle itself. We ask that you would enliven and enlighten our faith today as we study um, the Word of God and that you would bless our conversations as always, that they would be pleasing in your sight and edifying to all who are a part of them. All of this we pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, so... Um, a few reviews. Uh, in fact, quite a bit of uh, material was covered last week, and um, in our review, uh, we we discovered that in in Philadelphia, um, for the first time, there does not appear to be any what, Come no on. complaints. It was all commendations for the church in Philadelphia, uh, and then. Um, 
uh, the, the normal pattern is, is that God would offer, Jesus himself would offer complaints and then commendations. We know that there was persecution going on in the life of the church in Philadelphia. And the teaching point was that if you keep God's word, opposition will be unavoidable. Opposition will be unavoidable. Again, this is all by way of review. And uh, I, this is something that we've seen over and over and over in the congregations, yep. these seven churches. Um, there was a quick comfort that, that Christ offered to the church in Philadelphia. In verse 8, Jesus mentions an open door. Um, now, we learned or were reminded Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture. And so what we did was we did a little exploration in Scripture of what doors are mentioned. And we were given two options. Uh, option one was the door of what? So who, who was here? Salvation? Yes, yeah, the door of salvation, right? And option two was the door of opportunity, right? Very good. Those of you uh, helping us out with our quick reviews. There was the door of salvation and the door of opportunity. Um, very likely, which door is Jesus referring to in the church of Philadelphia? A door of opportunity, right? An opportunity for ministry. And we use the illustration, if you recall, uh, when COVID struck. Mm -hmm. Pastor Clayton, you weren't here, but I wasn't. Uh, we missed you. Thank you. Uh, I missed you guys too. I, I, I you know, th for, for the entire class, I kept looking at my phone, hoping you were going to text. I, I was actually in, s I, I was able to, I was able to be on that side of Sunday school last Sunday at this time. And okay. So, in a different, in, in a, a different, in a different, in a church. Lutheran church. Though. In a Lutheran church. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, we, we use the illustration that when COVID struck, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things shut down. And what was the big opportunity that was presented to Faith Lutheran? Yeah, I mean, we started to live stream. We upgraded all of our audiovisual yep. uh, um, hardware and software. And so uh, we're able to do things that we have not been able to do before. Uh, an honest assessment. They were, uh, Jesus talked about them being of little strength. Uh, what was the teaching point for this? God chooses the weak. weak to shame the strong. They were maybe a small church. Perhaps they um, were weak in their social standing in the community. We don't know. Uh, but again, this is all by way of review. Uh, in verse 11, Jesus says, I am coming soon. <laughs> Where is he then? <laughs> right? And, and we, we pointed out three things about that statement. Number one, God is eternal. All right? So soon to Jesus. <laughs> right. this, is like, this is like First Peter sort of stuff, right? Yeah. God is not slow as some yeah. people count that's slow. Se that's Second Peter, Second chapter Peter. 3. And yes, we did go to that text and look at it. So God is eternal. Number two, um, the church has continued to hold what we call the imminent return of Jesus Christ. So Every one of us should be mindful that Jesus could return at what point? Any point. Any point. And then number three, and this is the point that you just made, Pastor Clayton, God is patient. patient. He's waiting for more people to come to, um, to faith in, in, the, um, in Christ. So that's our review. Any questions or cop, uh, comments on review from last week? And I know if you weren't here you feel like you just had your face attached to a fire hydrant and we opened it up on you. But that's just the way it goes. Um, so now at least you have the notes from, from last week. All right. So let's get into, um, let's get into the, uh, the, the class for today, which means you need to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 7. And we're going to read through that one more time. I'll read because I know Pastor Clayton may have to be dealing with some technical stuff here yep. in just a second. So, to the church in Philadelphia, this is what Jesus says. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. 
Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write him I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So uh, covering some new material, let's go back to verse 7. How does Jesus refer to himself in verse 7? All right, so we've got holy and true. What else? That's not all that's in verse 7. These are the words of him who is holy and true, and what? Has the key of David. He holds the key of David. So holy, true, the key of David. Go ahead, what else does he say? Who opens and no one will shut. Holy, true, key of David. And the, this, there's this door that no one can open or shut, all right? Except, so, except him, right? Except him, except him, right. So this, yeah. is all in, this is all in verse 7. So we have to, um, again, we learned last week, Scripture interprets Scripture. So let's key in. <laughs> you like that pun? <laughs> let's key in on this key image. We've, uh, it is of interest that we have two parallel things. Thing, we have two parallel images in this Revelation text. Yep. We had uh, the door last week. Uh, today we're going to talk about the key. Yeah. <laughs> what is the key? Um, and, and how do keys show up in Scripture? So, what comes to mind when you hear the word key? Door. All right, we already got that, John. That's kind of a... Uh... <laughs> John, we got, we got door. What, what comes... Lock. You lock or you... Unlock. Unlock. You got basically two options mm -hmm. with a key, right? What happens if you lose a key? You're out of luck. You're in trouble, right? Uh, it's, it's bad news, right? Um, where do keys show up in Scripture? Pastor Clayton, any key passages come to mind? Uh, Jesus gives to Peter the keys of salvation, right? Ah, so... Um, let's look at Matthew chapter 16. This is a very, very famous passage um, made famous by the Pope in Rome. Yeah, because the seal, the seal of the Pope is uh, two keys, two yep. over, overcrossed keys. If, if you know anything about the Roman Catholic denomination, uh, the, uh, the Pope's seal, his official seal, has two uh, overcrossed keys. And um, it's based on this text, Matthew chapter 16. And um, we're going to hopefully correct the bad theology here on that. But uh, So Matthew chapter 16, if you look at verse 19, this is what... Um, actually, we should start at verse 17, shouldn't we, Pastor? Yeah. Uh, would you mind reading that? Yep. <coughs> and Jesus answered him, that is Peter, uh, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, which means son of Jonah, uh, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven... And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. All right, so what are the keys to the kingdom that Jesus is talking about here? Any thoughts? Pastor Clayton, what do you think? Well, so if we look at, well, so building the church, and then Jesus talks about what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, um, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I think, in, oh, and you've got, it, you've got it mentioned here, John 20. We're going to go to that in just a second. So it's, it's, it's sins. It's the forgive, forgiving or not forgiving people their sins. That's what the, the keys that have been granted, that were given to Peter to build the church or is the, the authority to forgive sins. So this is interesting. Now, this doesn't jump out right away in this text, does it? It just talks about binding and unbinding 
uh, or excuse me, binding and loosing. What's, mm -hmm. what's bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What's loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so again, Scripture interprets. So we have another text that gives us more information, mm -hmm. and that will be John chapter 20. So you want to turn now to John 20. Um, if you were wondering if Jesus gave these keys to Peter alone, <laughs> Um, this is the text that kind of clarifies that for us. Remember, we don't take one passage in isolation without the whole, um, the whole counsel of God. Uh, and that means all of Scripture. So in John chapter 20, Jesus makes a resurrection appearance to the disciples. And this is what he says. Pastor Clayton, would you mind reading that? Yep, and what, uh, 19. 19. Uh, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. All right. So, if you forgive, it is forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness, it is withheld. So, these two passages, uh, folks, they go together. You cannot, you cannot look at this conversation without looking at both texts. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus uses the whole key image, binding and loosing. But here, he, he basically gets a little bit more explicit. He says, it's to forgive or to withhold forgiveness. Because that's what it means to lock the door of eternity or to unlock the door. What is the key? The key is... <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. The wonderful uh, children's message answer, the wonderful Sunday school answer. It sounds like a squirrel with a bushy tail, but it's Jesus, right? Um, it, that's, that's correct. It is Jesus and the forgiveness of sins. So who is Jesus giving this to? Now, this is the big debate right. that has taken place over the centuries. Right. Luther, 500 years ago, well, before that, before even before, right. before that, um, the Church of Rome said that this was just to Peter, <clears throat> that these keys were given to just Peter, and that Peter was, uh, by Jesus himself, mm -hmm. made the first pope. Sort of, yeah. That's so, that's what <clears throat> that's what the Roman Catholic Church has said in retrospect, right? So if you go back and you look at the church history. We met, we've mentioned some of this stuff on our Wednesday classes. There were five seats, five S E E S E E S C's. There were the, the bishops over area. So there was uh, Jerusalem by, by honor, right? Even though Jerusalem was a backwater. There was Jerusalem by honor. There was Alexandria. There was Constantinople, Antioch, and Rome. And they were all, all of these bishops of these places, these C's, these popes of these places, were equals. And it wasn't until the Roman Empire began to fall and Attila the Hun starts to come down and there are some other theological controversies that, that these other bishops start to sort of default to the authority of Rome. And they're like, hey, Rome's still kind of a thriving sort of a place. What do you think? And then they started following. And so in retrospect, the Roman Catholic Church has said, see, the Bishop of Rome has always been the, the leader of the, of the Catholic Church, of the Universal Church. But and, the point that and, you're making is, in the first 400 years of the ancient church, it was not Rome. It was not Rome. It right? was the church. It was the church. Broken up for a, appropriate administration of the things on earth. And so um, it, it's only at, at kind of retro, retroactively... Mm -hmm. The, the Roman Catholic Church has pulled this Matthew 16 text and used it to justify mm -hmm. uh, the Pope being the vicar of Christ on earth. Okay? The vicar of Christ on earth. Uh, now, um, we, won't go into, we won't go into any more commentary on that except to say Luther comes along and he course corrects. Luther course corrects the church. Mm -hmm. He says, no. There, there, there was in the first four, uh, four centuries of the, of the Christian church, the Pope of Rome was not uh, ultimate. Mm -hmm. He was not head over the church. And 
uh, Luther also takes these other passages and he impacts them together. If you go, uh, where are y'all at? Are y'all in the Matthew text or the John text that we just... So John, in John, yeah. you see where um, the second person pronoun is used. So uh, verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. That's a second person pronoun. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Uh, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you, again, and uh, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. All four usages of this second person pronoun are plural, plural not singular. In other words, it's not, he's not saying you, Peter, or, or you, John, mm -hmm. or, or you, James, or you individually. He's talking to you, y'all. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's y'all, okay? Jesus. So if you want to, go ahead and take a pen or a pencil and write y'all into all four of those yous. That, that will be helpful for you. Um, I am sending, sending y'all. And if y'all forgive anyone uh, their right. sins, they are forgiven. If y'all withhold that forgiveness, it is withheld. Right. So this is what we call the church. We call this the office of the keys. All right. Now, this is a very important conversation to be had. Who holds the keys of David? Jesus, right? Uh, the key of David, uh, and, and now, of course, we've got the image of David being mixed into this, right? Um, why David? He's the greatest king. Jesus the is greatest the son of David. The greatest king of Israel's history. I've, I talk about this uh, enough. You should know this, but during David's reign, the Is uh, Israel was the superpower, okay? I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. They, uh, King David ruled all the way from what is present-day Iraq, okay? The Tigris Euphrates, the entire Fertile Crescent, from the Tigris Euphrates all the way down the Levant, down to the Nile River, uh, which was the, you know, the, the key boundary for Egypt. David ruled all that because he defeated everybody he ever went up against. Right. Well, the Lord had given him rest on all, on all sides. On all sides. So the Egyptians were, um, I don't know, they were suppressed in right. some way. The, the, um, the Assyrian nation hadn't were, really been a thing they, yet. They, they hadn't really come to power yet. Um, and so David ruled all of this. And, and kings literally paid tribute to David um, and to the Israelites. So that's why it's called the Key of David, this great and mighty kingdom that um, the Israelites longed to see again, right? This is one of the reasons why they missed Jesus being the Messiah, right? They wanted Jesus to carry a, a sword, a sword and, and to lead them in battle and, and to have this superpower, to restore this superpower status to the Israelites again. And when Jesus came and, and, yeah. uh, and said, put your sword away, yeah. he who lives by the sword will die by the sword right and then peter takes well, out his sword and cuts off malchus's cuts off ear. Malchus's ear it's always fun until somebody loses an ear yeah. right um, my mama taught it it's always fun until someone loses an eye but oh. uh i you know yeah. you, you yeah, have to you, you have adapt. to you have to change it, it just a little bit interestingly in the gospels the on palm sunday the crowds cheer david at, or cheer jesus as the son of david um and the is it the ten lepers or just the lepers that cry out from a distance? Say, have mercy on us, son of David. Son of David. And so it's, it's interesting. That's Luke 17. Yeah, it's interesting who calls Jesus the son of David and who doesn't call Jesus the son of David. And so um, they recognize that they, they, um, um, they, they, were, they wanted to see in Jesus the second coming of David. That's who the Messiah, in essence, was mm -hmm. supposed to be. Right. And so they missed it. Uh, and so that's why Key and David get put together in this context. It's a powerful kingdom, all right? Mm -hmm. So, what pow who, who's, I guess we have to start off by saying, whose keys are these? Who owns the keys? Christ, Jesus does. Christ. These are Christ's keys. But who has Jesus entrusted the keys to? The church. The church. So that's the teaching point. Jesus has entrusted the keys of the kingdom to the church, not to the 
hope. All right, this is this is a big difference right. between uh, right. you know and, and the, the Roman Catholic denomination and the Lutheran uh, Church Missouri Synod. Right. We 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 have a different we have a different understanding of this text. Yeah. And it, it's more it's more about the power to forgive sins than it is about organizational structure, right? That the Pope withholds this power and the the Pope has it and he doles it to the archbishops and the bishops the archbishops give it to the bishops and the bishops give it to the priests and then the priests hold on to it in the local parish, right? And so it's this top-down doling out and restriction of the forgiveness of sins. There's no, there's no scripturally mandated way to organize a church except around the forgiveness of sins and the offering of the sacraments, right? And so it's, it's not the structure... It's the it's the power, I guess. It's the power that the Pope the claims. Authority. The authority. There's that, a difference between power and authority. Okay, difference between power and authority. If you drive down here on the on the uh, on the interstate and you see these five, these re- Dodge Ram no. Ram Hemi trucks, and they have a lot of power, right? You see these these uh, these muscle cars, uh, but they all slow down when they see the little uh, highway patrolman on the motorcycle. Why? Mm-hmm. Because he's got the authority. Because he has the authority. So there's a big difference between power and authority. Yeah, the, the guy in the muscle car has power, but he doesn't have authority. Yeah. And so this is, this is a very, very important point mm-hmm. to be made. Uh, and the church has this authority, okay? And it is of interest that, it, as you say, it's not top. It is, it it, is sort of kind of top down because yeah. Jesus gives it to the church. You actually are stewards of the keys, all right. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Um, you have the keys. Uh, y- you apply the keys in your life. Um, for example, dads, mm-hmm. uh, whenever whenever your children disobey, yep. What do you do? You My got, children never disobey. I know. Anymore, I know. So, so you you're out of practice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we will. Yes. Yes. My wife disobeys. Yes. Um, she said it. She, she said it. She said it. She said it. We're, it's on record. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so yeah. So so fathers. So, so uh, fathers apply this law and gospel. Fathers and parents too, right? But right. but fathers and, and and parents they withhold and they bind and they loose. Um, and you you know this. You know that if you have an obstinate child, uh, that you got to bring the hammer down until. You know, I bring it until they cry. Um, <laughs> I got to know that it works. <laughs> um, it, it's, zero, it's a zero to 60 thing in our house. No, no, I know what happens. You break them until they say, St. Anne, I'll right, become a that's monk. Right, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so, you, so, so, par- so parents have this authority to help children see the errors that they've made, right? To see how they've violated the, the rules of the house or the, the, the authority of the parents and then to apply the healing balm of the gospel to say, hey, we're on the same page here. You, we both understand you have done wrong and look at me. As Jesus has forgiven you, I forgive you. Um, and this is, this is a, an important um, thing to do with your children and your grandchildren. And and you and, know and, as, re, and in relationships, any, any relationship. Yeah. Um, so I was I was reading. I've been reading Robin. But, but oh. it, it goes along with the you know the, the the priesthood of all believers. You are the priesthood yeah. of God. You are a holy nation, a chosen people, uh, precious and holy yeah. to God. And 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 because of your access to the Father through faith in the Son, you can apply these keys. Yeah. Uh, I. Hold your thought, yep, I'm it. Warren. You had your you you were I I passed you over uh, at least once. So the question is, when do you not forgive? So let's just move down on the study guide yeah. real quick. What are the two options that the church has? All right, you either what forgive or don't forgive. or you withhold forgiveness. Uh, I, I think I would prefer you to use the biblical, the biblical um, image and not, you know, to not forgive. I think it's withholding forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that you're not forgiving; you're withholding it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think they're, they're, they're yeah. subtly, it's subtly different. The church has the authority to forgive or not, or or withhold forgiveness. Now, who do you forgive? 
the the child who's in tears over their mistake. Right, who just cried out, I'll become a monk. Right. All right. So you forgive the person who's broken. Mm -hmm. Who uh, who has forgiveness withheld? The the child who remains up. Like, you know, if if we're using the if we're if we started with the example of children, right? The 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 child who is in the middle of a temper tantrum, the child who's refusing to have a reasonable conversation. Uh, uh, I, I have been known, it hasn't happened in a long time, I've been known to just shut the door. Open the door, are you ready to talk? And they fly off the handle. This has only happened once and it just stuck in my head. Um, they, they fly off and they're not ready to have a conversation. Shut the door, I'm, withhold, I'm withholding that forgiveness. And then when they're, when they're ready to have that conversation, even still, I, I'm not going in there ready to just say, I'm, I'm going in ready to say, I forgive you, but we got. I got to make sure that they understand that what they have done has violated the the rules of the house, or whatever those whatever the situation might be. Um, so that's that's the withholding of forgiveness. Now, how so, do, and we got we got to apply and the word, this out. The right? word we're looking for, the key, to, is repentance. Mm-hmm. Is a person repentant or not repentant? Right. A contrite heart, O oh, oh Lord, right? Yeah, and, and, and the contrition, we have to be very careful with contrition. Contrition is um, just part of the story, all right? Uh, contrition, uh, people can be sorry they got caught, right? You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. There are lots of people who are sorry, uh, they're contrite, but it's only because they got busted, all right? Um, and, and um, but... True repentance is to not only be contrite, but to turn away from the sin. All right. And so that's the key, repentance or unrepentance. And if there is someone in the life of the church who is living outside of the the, the boundaries that God has established. All right. What are those boundaries? The Ten Commandments, the law. That's the easiest way. Easiest way to talk about it is the law. We have the law. We have the boundaries God has established. You live outside of those boundaries in unrepentance with forgiveness will be withheld. All right? If you're willing to repent Mm -hmm. and willing to come back, uh, turn away from sin and come back within the boundaries God has established, forgiveness is dispensed. That's how this this works. Um, And... and, uh, this is the way God has worked with right. His people from the beginning of creation. Uh, now remember, what does we talked about this a few weeks ago? What does God really want to do? Wants to forgive. What's His primate? What's His uh, uh, opus, proprium. opus proprium? His proper work. Forgiving sins. He wants to forgive. That's His. That's His desire. Just like the dad wants to forgive the child, he's looking for a reason to forgive the child, but. Um, Unfortunately, not everybody responds to that. And so um, this is the difference between law and gospel. And this is what the keys are. Uh, and the, Jesus has these, he is this key, uh, mm-hmm. and he has dispensed it to the church. Now, what does the church do with the keys? What do you do with the keys? Phil, say it. You, you, you entrust them to the other office of the New Testament church. There are two offices. The off, oh, oh, you got keys. I got it. I, you got got a key. I have the key. So, so uh, I have a truck. <laughs> it's, your, it's yours. Uh, and you can start that truck from right here. You could. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I hope I don't push any wrong you won't. buttons. You'll be all right. Does the truck self-drive? No, Will it just drive do off the parking lot? It doesn't do that. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, that'd be kind of cool, you know. It would you can be, have right? a little like monitor here. <laughs> it's very uh, like, it's like uh, playing a video game. It's like a very Dick Tracy sort of it thing, right? It is Dick Tracy. It's awesome. Oh yeah, I'm driving out of the parking lot. I'm gonna go pick up. Little anyway, Caesars. so the keys. So, the the church entrusts the key to the office of the holy ministry, and of course that is the the rightfully called pastors of the church. What we do is we hold on to the keys. Um, and we administer them publicly. So at the beginning of every worship service, when um, you confess your sins, what does the pastor say? In the, by, the, in the, <laughs> by the power invested, something like that. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you, right? As a called and ordained servant of Christ, 
I forgive you all of your sins. And a lot of denominations have a problem with uh, that. People, there are a lot of churches that do have a problem with that. I had a, a, a someone, this was years ago, uh, he visited Faith Lutheran, and he never came back. And when I had the follow-up conversation with him, he said that he did not believe that one man could forgive um, over a, a congregation like that. No one has that authority. Um, I pointed out, John chapter 20, that Jesus is the one who dispenses these keys to the church, but that did not seem to work. Scripture did not seem to work for him. So Right, because it's not, it's not the our forgiveness that we're announcing, That's right? That's correct. But because we're not, we're in as much need of forgiveness as everybody, right? More, perhaps. Uh, you know, as pastors, we're we're fallible, and we certainly have clay feet. And my wife will tell you that. Um, but the the bottom line is <laughs> the bottom <laughs> the bottom line is that um, if a pastor should take a call to another congregation, what does he do with the keys? He back. returns them to the church, uh, and then the church calls, um, seeks a rightly called um, uh, individual to fill the office of the holy ministry and gives them the keys. But the keys belong to the church, and you have to remember that. They're not the pastor's keys. They're the church, well, they're Christ's keys, and he, had, he um, um, entrusts them to the church. And so it's not to one individual that we're talking about, all right? Uh, so... Here's the, here's the deal. The reality of the situation is, is that a teaching point, there is coming a day when the door to salvation is going to be what? Shut. Shut. Now, we have other images of door in the New Testament that we did not cover last week. For example, um, Pastor Clayton, do you remember the parable of the ten virgins? Yeah, at the, the right. wedding, right? So r as fast as you can, give us a Cliff Notes version. There's ten, there are ten virgins waiting for the wedding party to show up. Correct. The wedding party is delayed. Five of the vir their shout comes from somewhere off stage. Uh, the, the groom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. So all ten of the virgins wake up. Five have no oil, and five have enough oil to trim their wicks and light their lamps go in, to go into the feast. The other five have gone off to buy oil in the middle of the night, and they come back, and the door is shut. And it, does the door get opened? It does not. It does not. And Jesus even says, I think, in that very parable, and there is weeping. Where there, in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth. Tea. Uh -huh. All right. So this door image also gets used in the sense, not, not just as an, you know, we talked about the narrow door, right? The narrow way uh, last week. Broad, wide is the road, broad is the path that leads to destruction. Many are on it, but narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and only a few find it, right? Um, you know, now is the, is the day of salvation. And so the church must make every effort to do what? What do you think we're supposed to be doing? Pardon? Yeah, but for, for the world. I mean, as, uh, in regards to the door and the key, what's our, what is our effort all about? Witnessing. Witnessing, right? Getting the message out. Letting folks know that the door is... is <laughs> It's only going to be open for a short mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. um, what did Jesus say in verse 11? I am coming soon. soon. Uh, and again, I know you're, you're thinking to yourself, uh, he hasn't been here yet. You know, uh, when's he going to get here? But we talked about that. God's eternal uh, and he is being patient with all mm -hmm. of us um, and wanting more people to enter that narrow gate. This is what our task is to be. Uh, and, and I have to ask, I have to challenge, you know, are, is that what we're doing? Is, is that what we're about here at Faith Lutheran? Is that what you're about in your individual witness? Only you can answer that question. It's not meant to, I'm not, I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm just, let's just make an honest assessment. Um, are we making that proclamation? Are we inviting? Mm -hmm. I mean, the invitation, open door. Yeah. We, have, have you come to church? Uh, Pastor Clayton, you invited a neighbor to a Wednesday morning mm -hmm. Bible class a few weeks ago. Yeah. And did he come? He did. He did. He came. He, did. he came to the class. You know? uh, the, oh, I would say the Sunday school class that I was in yes, last week, uh, the pastor was going. This church is a, it's an old church that my parents go to. And so their pastor was going through the archives and uh, was reading a letter from a, one of the pastors back in the, I think, back in the 50s. 
Um, and in this letter, it was a letter to a, a, new, a, a new family that had joined the congregation and said something like, uh, and now that you've been one for, one for Christ, you will no doubt want others to be one as well. Please give me three names and phone numbers of people uh, that we might contact to bring into the, to win for Christ. Um, j- but just, you know, that idea of you're, you're in, you've gone through the door, who are some other folks that we can, you know, use this, this image of? And not everyone takes the invitation. I've had multiple conversations as a pastor here at Faith Lutheran, at Kroger, uh, at Fair on the Square, at, at Walmart, mm-hmm. um, and, and uh, even, even in my birding, uh, I've had conversations about, um, hey, you know, you're always welcome to, to join mm-hmm. us, and uh, that doesn't, it doesn't happen, you know. So, but the, the bottom line is you, you open that, you open that, that door mm-hmm. of invitation um, and, and offer, um, offer people a place to worship, uh, offer people a place to fellowship. So anyway, uh, we're running out of time, so let's keep going. Um, there is a, three, uh, a final threefold comfort that Jesus offers in this text. What does he say? In verse, uh, we, we should be getting down to verse... So you should go back to Revelation chapter 11, 3, by the way. Verse 11. Yeah, verse 11. What does he say? Hold fast what you have. So hold on to what you have. We've heard Jesus say this to a previous congregation in a, in, in, among the seven churches. Hold on to what you have. What do you have? You have the truth. Hold on to it. Don't let go of it. Number one, the one who is victorious, I will make a what? A pillar. Now this is an interesting image. Uh, you know, we've had the, the door, we've had the key, and now we have the pillar, and uh, along with that, the new Jerusalem, what, and the temple uh, gets mentioned in mm-hmm. this text. What famous pillars are there in the Bible? Uh-huh. There's the pillar Lots of salt. Life. <laughs> oh my goodness, Maria. I, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, so, uh, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. That, that's, that's one of the more, the, that's the, one of the more forgotten pillars. The, of the well, the the apostles are teach amongst the colonnade of Solomon and that the, is, uh, that the is temple, true. That which is, true. is a, a colonnade is uh, full of columns. But in this context, uh, since the temple of God, uh, he says, verse twelve. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple. Temple. Okay, so what, um, how many of y'all know how many pillars there were? For, oh my goodness, there's a spider oh, coming down. I thought I just had a floater in my <laughs> eye. <laughs> no, it's a spider. It's literally, it's, that's interesting. Julie, don't look. Yeah. Um, you can see it on, I think you can see it on camera. No, you the, can't. The, the, oh, no, you can. You can totally see it on camera. All right. The, the spider is going to crawl away. Aww. The spider is going to go over there. We don't want to be distracted by a spider. So when the temple was built, all right, what, um, what three basic architectural um, areas did the temple have? You got the Holy of Holies. You got the holy place. And then you have the portico. And the portico had two pillars. Turn in your Bibles very quickly, 2 Chron- Chronicles 3.17. 2 Chronicles 3.17, the spider is going to be okay. That's what you say. Well, you know, spider, the, the world is filled with spiders. If it wasn't for spiders, we'd be overrun with bugs. Perhaps. 2 Chronicles 3.17, Pastor Clayton, you got that for I us. I got it. Read it. He set up pillars in front of the temple. Who, one, who set up? I'm guessing it's Solomon. 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 Uh, uh, Solomon set up pillars in the front of the temple, one on the south, the other on the north. That on the south he called uh, Jachin, and on that on the north, Boaz. So it would be Yaquin and Boaz. The pillars actually get names. <laughs> uh, so Yaquin and Boaz. Now, um, how important are names in the Bible? Very they're very important. Point okay. to the power, right? They, they point to the power. So, Yaquin comes from the Hebrew word to establish, and Boaz comes from the Hebrew word, or it, it's actually, it's better to go with the Septuagint translation, which is um, 
uh, the word for strength, to establish strength. All right, so the pillars get named establish strength. This is pretty cool stuff. Um, and, and what is Jesus telling the, the congregation there in Philadelphia? You're, You're going to become what? A pillar. He's going to establish strength. <laughs> He's going to establish strength in you. Uh, you're going to become a pillar of faith. Uh, and this is so significant because um, geographically and, and historically, Philadelphia was prone to earthquakes. <laughs> in AD 17, the entire city was destroyed, leveled, and they rebuilt it, right? Um, why would they do that? It's like, yeah, we can have that conversation in, in a lot of different contexts. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, um, ha- this is an image of strength, um, especially in the face of so much shakiness in the world. I have to ask the question, how do you see the world today being shaken to its core? War. I mean, we got, mm-hmm. who expected that? Did anybody expect that? I mean, I don't think anybody was expecting Putin to go into um, to Ukraine. I, I mean, not, I, I not really wasn't. For, not for 100 days like this. No, this is nuts, right? Um, how else is the world being shaken to its core? Mm. Pardon? Famine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. One of the one of the uh, consequences of of current events is that we're looking at uh, we're looking at a coming famine uh, in in certain parts of the world. Um, what else? <laughs> supply chain right. issues, Econ- economic yep. dis- disruption, e- economic disruption uh, a- around the world. Uh, we're paying more for gasoline than we have ever paid in the history of this nation. I mean, it's weird, right? Weird stuff is going on, um, and, and and we're all kind of we're all kind of calm about it, it's ca- which is kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, we're kind of like taking it on the chin. But yeah. what else is going on? Disease. All right, disease. What about sp- what about morality and? Uh, uh, um, there, there are people openly calling for for it to be legal to uh, rip babies out of wombs. They're calling for uh, uh, it, be, it to be openly legal to rip babies out of wombs. It's sad, isn't it? Mm-hmm. What can 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 you? So the <laughs> was said that did they Cal- pass the law or they're. So we're being told, I, I'm, I haven't vetted, if you're right. online, I haven't vetted this source. Okay. <laughs> but uh, at, least, at least proposed legislation in California to kill a child up to 28 days after birth. That's, uh, again, we're, we're talking about the world is being shaken to its core. Um, there are, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, we need to, we need to, have a a rock we need to have a place that we can go Uh, when everything is shaking and falling apart where do you go what what is what is your strength what is your security is it is it your retirement portfolio (laughs) we scoff at that one right now Mm -hmm. too right don't look at it Uh, is it is it um, uh, your possessions is it your your relationships is it your job is it your status you know where do you go is it that one person in your life who is your be-all and end-all? Mm-hmm. I mean, what if all of that is taken away? Uh, where will you go? Where will you seek strength, you know, mm-hmm. and security? And all that will be taken away. And that, Chris, that, that's, that you're ab- absolutely right. At some, at, at one point, it's all going to be taken away. Where are you going to turn? What's going to be your strength and your solace? Jesus is promising that he will be that strength for you. Um, This is why Psalm 46 is such a powerful psalm. If you know anything about Psalm 46, it is the inspiration for Martin Luther when he wrote his most famous hymn. John, what is that hymn? Mighty Fortress. That's right, a mighty fortress is our God. Not a mighty mighty salt pillar. Uh, No, no, a mighty fortress is our God. Uh, this is uh, so. This psalm, uh, I would encourage you because we've run out of time. Read it today, and remember that the mountains are shaking and falling into the heart of the sea all around us, and that there is one place that we can go, and that God is our. Um, that's the last teaching point. Jesus is the rock of our salvation, and I'm here to tell you, if Jesus is unmoved, and your faith is founded on Him, you will be unmoved. 
And of course, the last thing there is that uh, he's going to write on them the name of God himself. So would you add anything, Pastor Clayton? We can go for one more minute. I didn't want to steal any of your... I think we got it. All right. Any questions or comments that anybody has? Uh, Philadelphia, uh, it's a, um, it's a, a great story uh, of uh, persecution. Uh, they're a small congregation. They're weak in some regards. But God, um, he turns the tables and he will make them strong. So, all right. Go with the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.